So tonight, I'm pleased to introduce Albert Wood Fox to politics and prose. In his book, Solitary... In his book, Solitary, Woodfox shares his life story from his rebellious childhood in the South to his current life of activism around the world. For much of his life, Woodfox was behind bars in Angola, one of Louisiana's, if not the nation's, most notorious prisons. After being initially imprisoned for armed robbery, Woodfox joined the Black Panther Party, inspired by its social commitment and code of living. When a white guard was killed, he and another Panther Party member were immediately accused of the crime and placed in solitary confinement, where they would both and another remain for decades. Aware that anger and bitterness could destroy him, Woodfox instead channeled such feelings into activism and resistance, resolving to never be broken by inhumanity or corruption. Woodfox remains a committed activist to this day, speaking to many audiences, including The Innocence Project, Harvard, Yale, the National Lawyers Guild, and now Politics and Prose. Reverend Leah Daughtry, co-author of For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Politics, writes, Albert Woodfox shares his coming-of-age story with crystal-cleared perspective, holding nothing back as he unwraps the unvarnished truth of his life. Deftly weaving the undeniable threads of race, class, and systemic inequities that make his story and so many similar ones possible, his journey of resilience, perseverance, growth, and triumph is at once a cautionary tale, a challenge to all we think we know about the justice system, and an inspiring testimony to the power of human spirit. Woodfox will be joined in conversation tonight by Catherine M. Kimple, current visiting lecturer in law at Yale Law School, and formerly one of Woodfox's legal representatives. Now, please join me in welcoming Albert Woodfox and Catherine Kimple. So I have to start tonight with a story, a little one that'll lead into a question for Albert about Albert. When you read his book, um, one of the things that jumps out to me is something that also really stood out to me when I was getting to know him, which is how compassionate and caring he is throughout. Um, in the book, you, you, you hear stories of him taking care of his siblings when he was younger taking care of a baby rabbit he finds in a field and manages to smuggle out of the prison um, for his sister, but also taking care of others who were incarcerated with him, whether it was making sure that they shared a cot in the dungeon cell or learned how to read, were protected from being raped, um, uh, were able to maintain some measure of sanity and dignity and solitary confinement that care runs throughout. Uh, But I've personally experienced and witnessed that caring as well, Um, whether it was the first question always out of his mouth was, how's Herman? How's he doing? Uh, What what can we do for him? Or when we were talking about all of the petty indignities of litigation, what can you do to make this less burdensome for King? What can, can we make it? Can we take it a little easier on him? Let's 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 be gentle. Uh, Or even when I would call. So I used to call once a week to make sure that the wardens and everyone else at the prison remembered the lawyers were watching. Um, And inevitably, if I was stressed or sad or sick or otherwise out of sorts, he would hear it in my voice and would say, well, how are you? How are you? What's going on? And he wouldn't just ask. He would want to problem solve and give me wise advice and help. And so... Um, it's just such a striking aspect of your personality. And I, I'd love to start there. How, how, where do you think that came from, that compassion and empathy and caring for others? Uh, before, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> and before I you know, answer your question, I'd like to ask Leslie Joy to stand, please. Uh, <laughs> Leslie Joy. <laughs> She helped, you know, this could have been a different book if it not been for her influence, you know. Uh, it is, but gently. Maybe. Uh, you know, while the book is my voice and my experience, the influence of Leslie Judd made it a much better book. So I just want to acknowledge her. 
Uh, now, what's your question? Caring. caring. That's another example of caring, uh, taking I, care of others. Well, it all starts at home with, with my mother. You know, my mother uh, fought valiantly to try to save me from becoming a product of the street. Unfortunately, you know, the, the voice of the street was louder than my mother's. And eventually, the voice of the Black Panther Party was louder than the voice of the street. And there I began my first step in the journey that has me sitting here before all these wonderful people at night, talking about 44 years and 10 months of horror and brutality and individual, institutional, and systemic racism that exists in this country and in prisons in particular. So, you know, caring about other people started with my mom. You know, she's one of the most caring women that uh, I've had the experience of knowing. Let's talk a little bit about the Black Panther Party. Uh, for some, even that the name and the concept can be scary or off-putting. I think there's a lot of misconceptions for you. Um, the Black Panther Party and its principles was a source of hope um, and direction. Can you talk a little bit about um, what it was that so you found so compelling and, and sort of how that um, gave you strength in, in those hard times? Well, you know, prior to joining the Black Panther Party, I was a product of the, I guess, systematic racism in America. And, uh, you know, I was a predator. I preyed upon the people in my own community, my own neighbors, and people at large in society. And uh, as a result, I wound up in prison. And, uh, but, uh, and I escaped, and I went to New York because I was familiar with Harlem. And, uh, but this was not the Harlem I had seen before, you know, the last time I was. This was a Harlem that had men and women moving amongst the community with so much pride and so much respect and so much determination. And up to that point, I had always sensed or could feel fear in African Americans in this country because of the social position that we held. But for the very first time, I saw men and women who had no fear. And then I saw a police car patrolling Harlem. And lo and behold, the fear was in them. And, you know, that was very impressive. But I have to be honest, my initial interest in the party was the beautiful women. You know? uh, you know, the beauty that I mistakenly thought was physical, I later turned, you know, on, come to understand that the beauty was from within. It was their beliefs, their dedication, their discipline, their determination to protect the African-American community and other poor communities. And so, you know, that was my initial contact. And eventually, you know, at the time I was running, I had escaped and I was running from a 50 year sentence in, in Louisiana. And uh, eventually I was captured and, and placed in the uh, Manhattan House of Detention, which was a call of tunes. And uh, four members from the Panther 21, which was uh, 21 members who had been, uh, the headquarters had been attacked by New York police and there was a shootout and stuff. And, uh, you know, immediately they come on the and they, you know, introduce themselves and they start holding political classes and, you know, and, you know, I was listening, but I wasn't hearing what they were saying. So uh, eventually another guy that came down from upstate and I was in the cell with him. And, you know, after talking with him a couple of days, he said, you know, I have something I want you to read. And so he gave me a book called A Different Drummer. And up to that point, I did not believe that one individual could make a change. You know, or one, one individual could influence other individuals. And that book taught me, it was a fictional piece of, of, of work, but it was based upon the great migration of African Americans from the South to the 
you know, the West, the North part, the East part of this country, uh, this, this country, uh, seeking a better life, see, you know, uh, under the illusion that racism only existed in the South. And, but, you know, in spite of, uh, uh, what they were exposed to, they, you know, uh, even now today, you know, uh, they showed great determination and a willingness to sacrifice and work hard. And all they want is a, a equal uh, playing field. You know? Were there particular aspects of um, what the Black Panthers that you interacted with, what they sort of talked about in their ideology that had resonance for you being inside? Well, well, the most impressive thing, you know, here I am, a guy in prison with a 50-year sentence. And yet they saw in me a sense of worth and a sense of value. How many political organizations you know will take a person in prison, possibly for the rest of his life, and say, come join us, come be a part of us. And no matter how long you live, no matter how long you're in prison, we will be there for you. And so that was the initial and the first impression. Uh, Ten point program, which no, I can't recite now. It's been so many decades. <laughs> but the ten point program of the, the Black Panther Party was basically uh, a guide on how to uh, protect and serve the African American community and other poor communities. And uh, you know. Uh, some of the books that you know we had to read. Uh, one was uh, it was called a little red book, and it was by uh, uh, the leader of China, Chairman Mao Zedong. And you know, and uh, you know, from that point on, uh, once I read a different drama, up to that point I hadn't read a book, you know. But after that, I became an avaricious reader, and I began to, you know, as I said, not just listen but to understand what the party was saying and what other men and women in Chile and I encountered in the rest of my life, what they were saying. And, and so here we are here trying to give everyone an idea of what the horrors and the brutality of, of you know, solitary confinement, the useless of it, uselessness of it, and the uh, institutional, individual, and systemic racism that exists in prisons across this country. And since America influences the other world, uh, you know, the rest of the world, to, to try to, you know, King and I have been around the world to speak and to try to not them follow the practice of the United States, especially when they came to incarcerating people. I think there's a perception um, sometimes that solitary confinement and the way it's used is necessary in order to keep prison safe. It's a necessary part of a corrections institution. Um, you obviously have had firsthand experience about its abuses, and I think it'd be helpful to have you just share a little bit about why that's not your view or experience. <laughs> well, you know, uh, when you, you take a human being and you can find them to, in this case, uh, nine by six, cell and they only allowed out that cell one hour out of every 24 hours imagine that multiply that a million times imagine being confined to that area and not seeing any end in sight because you have no way of being released the only way to be released for myself and herman king was we had to renounce the black party black panther party renounce uh, social struggle, and uh, be good little boys. You know, 44 years and 10 months later, they got the answer. You know, uh, I'm sorry to say that we lost Harmon Wallace uh, after 41 years. He, he won his freedom as a result of the work of uh, Robert Hillary King, the other member, the living member of the A3, and the so, so many wonderful men, women, and children, especially attorneys, who joined in the struggle to free us. And unfortunately, three days after winning his freedom, he died from cancer. And That they had left untreated. Yeah. They, they didn't even, you know, they wouldn't even tell him he had cancer. 
had the lawyers not involved and threatened her and hired a, a doctors to come in and threaten to uh, go into court. They would have never taken him to the hospital and give him the diagnosis. And then after they did it, they went, what, 10 days or more without provide, giving him the medication that had been subscribed. So, you know, uh, it's still very hard for me to talk about. And, and he's with, you know, with me and in, in my heart and soul every day. Herman was a special man Very who special. managed to bring a brightness in life, I think, to some very dark and lifeless places. Yeah. Are there aspects of his friendship that stand out to you? Memories that you'd be willing to share that are indicative of his personality? Well, you know, Herman, as you know, Herman had a bigger than life personality. You know, he could, he could you know, light up a rum, you know. Like all humans, you know, he had, we all have faults and we all have idiosyncrasies, you know, and, and he was no different. But what was in his heart, what was in his soul, his commitment to social struggle, his commitment to, to humanity, you know, uh, was the foundation in which he, he stood on and the foundation in which, you know, he gave his life for, you know, because we all, uh, when we were initially put in solitary confinement in, in 72, course we we never thought that we would be there for decades you know but we all made a commitment to continue to struggle and to make whatever sacrifice was necessary and Harmon was an example you know and while it's not the only reason but if for no, for no other reason you know I could never walk away from being a, a social activist and doing the things I'm doing. But how, how, you know, I have to honor this man. He gave everything, including his life. I know that you all talked to me about some very purposeful choices you made about what you would and wouldn't do while in solitary in order to maintain your sanity, essentially. You want to talk a little bit about those choices? Oh, there were so many battles, you know. I think, Two, two of the battles that I think shaped not only us, but the men around us. Uh, one was they used to feed us under the door. They used to put our trays, and we had to drag our trays on these guilty, you know, doors. And, uh, you know, what is accepted today because the acts of one individual are a particular incident can raise your level of consciousness. And so what you will accept today is no longer acceptable tomorrow. And that's what the situation, uh, you know, uh, with being fed like animals, you know. And so we ask only that they cut food slots in the bars of the cell and feed us in a dignified manner. And they refuse. And so being held in solitary confinement, it was very limited on how we could resist this. So we went on a hunger strike that lasted 45 days. And uh, so eventually guys started passing out and, you know, becoming real ill. And so, you know, Robin and I was on the same tier and Hyman was on another tier, but we communicated regular, you know, with, with letters and stuff. And so we became concerned. Our first concern was always the men around us, the men that, that we led the men that followed us. So, you know, we talked about, you know, we had to find a way to end this with as much dignity as possible. So, you know, the uh, the security people, you know, uh, we asked to see the, the major of the camp. And so we made an agreement that uh, we would come off the hunger strike if they would cut food slots in the ball, and they agreed. And they they were determined though to make us pull slave trays on the door, and so we said we will if we can stand and hold our trays and eat through the bars. You know that's how we would eat until they cut the uh, bar. Of course, we never thought it would be eighteen months later. You know, so for eighteen months we ate through the bars, and you know they say you know. Uh, uh, 
contradictions is, is, is a mother of change. And so someone came up with the idea to make a little tree out of cardboard and string. And so, you know, that eventually, uh, you know, came the whole tier. So all, this, all the sales had these little cardboard trays. And, you know, so when they bring the food, they would set the tray on there. But up to that, you know, we used to stand there and hold the tray in one hand and eat through the bars in the other hand. Rather than be fed in an undignified and inhumane uh, uh, manner, you know, and the other uh, defining thing are uh, uh, strip searches, you know, uh, that's when a uh, prisoner is forced to strip naked in front of other prisoners and stuff, and bent over, spread the buttocks, and raise the genitals, and raise the feet, and open their mouth and stuff, and it was very abusive at the time. But until we began to understand that this was a tradition from child slavery, that this was something they used to make our ancestors do on slave box, you know, and this had nothing to do with security. You know, this, you know, the thing about Angola, it, it is, it is a form of plantation. And you have families that work there that's been there. They go back 15 generations. So their attitudes and and the way they look at African Americans is was passed down. It was a tradition, you know. And so, you know, once once you know we became aware of this because of the studies and the books we were reading and stuff, you know, it was no longer you know level of conscience had been raised that it was no longer acceptable to be treated like this. And so we decided to to resist this. So we physically you know, refused to, to be strip searched. And as a result of that, you know, we were gassed and beaten and placed in, in a dungeon. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, by the time the episode was over, I had something like 400 and something days in, in, uh, in, in the dungeon because uh, they would make me do 10 days and then they would, you know, take me out for a 24-hour rest period. And then when I went back, they were like, Okay, strip, and I would refuse, and they would, you know, get, it was eight or nine of them. They would jump me and beat me and slam me on the desk and forcibly spread my buttocks, making all kinds of derogatory and racist comments and stuff, you know. And as soon as I got up off the desk, I would just go to swinging like I was crazy, you know, because the humili humiliation and, and the undignity uh, of what they had just done to me. Uh, my level of conscience would just not let me accept this. You know what was important to me, and and is 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 very important to me now. So when I get up in the morning and look in the mirror, I'm not ashamed of what I'm looking at or what's looking back at me. And so that played a you know that was a great motivation that would not allow me to be strip searched forcibly, beaten and humiliated, and not fight back. And as a, each time that happened. I was written up, taken to disciplinary court, given more time in the dungeon. So eventually we, uh, you know, filed a, a, a civil suit and we won the case. And part of the, uh, uh, the judgment was the judge all of them to re release me from, from the dungeon and uh, take back all the time they had given. And so that was, I think out of all the things we did, uh, the other defining moment was, for me personally, was to teach another man how to read and write. You know, I thought that was, I still think that was probably, out of all the things I've done as a prison activist, as a social activist, I don't think anything will ever become more important to me than that. And, you know, the guy taught, uh, you call him Goldie. And one day we were talking, and after about six months, he was determined, you know, and using the dictionary and the voice key at the bottom of the page that teach you the difference between how the word is spelled as to how it's pronounced, I was able to teach him. And in six months' time, he was reading at the high school level. And the one thing he told me one day, he said, man, you have opened the world. Yeah. And 
So I think that was out of all the things I have done and stood for, I think that is probably my proudest moment. Obviously, um, you are, in fact, a part of why some of the things at Angola and Louisiana got better. But um, for those who don't have a lot of access to or interaction with incarcerated folks, either in Louisiana or elsewhere in the country, what what's your sort of, can you talk a little bit about how humane or inhumane uh, those places are? Well, one thing, I don't think most American citizens realize that under the 13th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, slavery is legal. There was a clause that was added in there after the Civil War in which they said no one should be held in slavery or involuntary solitude unless convicted of a felony. So every time a man, woman, a child in this country is convicted of a felony, you become a slave of the state. You lose all human rights, civil rights, constitutional rights. And the state can do what you as they please. The thing we try to do is remind mothers and fathers and grandfathers and aunts and uncles and brothers and sisters, these are your family. These people didn't come from another world. They come from your household. And the difference between your support can mean the difference between life and death for some of these men. And unfortunately, you know, I've had the, the horror of seeing men go insane. I've had the horror of seeing men take their own lives or injure themselves because they could not deal with the pressure of being confined to a cell 23 hours out of every 24-hour period. And, you know, uh, I think, you know, we we found the anti-rape squad because there was a driving sex market going on at Angola. And I remember one day before I was put in solitary, I was sitting on my bunk, and this little kid about 17 was assigned to the bunk across from me. And he had been raped. He had been gang raped. And I can't imagine anything more sad than to see a human being who has had his spirits broken. When you break a human being's spirit, he can never get it back. No matter how hard he tries, he may gain some semblance of, uh, of his dignity back or his pride, of, but you, you can't get that back. When you, when you break a man's spirit, it is forever. When you break a woman's spirit, it is forever. When you break a child's spirit, it is forever. And what I was dedicated to, it is no way that I could see this and not take action. So me and the other members who had, of the Black Panther Party chapter, Harmon and I had formed, uh, we decided to form any rape squads, and we provided protection for some of these kids as they came in in the prison. And sadly, after we were locked up for the murder of uh, Brent Miller, one of our members lost his life, you know, trying to, you know, protect a young man. And uh, he was stabbed to death for doing that. You also used the courts pretty effectively, I might say, to improve things for not just yourself, but countless other uh, inmates uh, in Louisiana. What are some of the ways, how did, how did you talk a little bit about how you learned the law? Uh, and this man knows a lot about the law. Uh, <laughs> learned the law and, and how to use it to effectuate change. Well, one of the things is, you know, as I see it earlier, you know, uh, each time your level of consciousness is raised, you become aware of what's going on around you. Now, I will, you know, we realized that we could not keep physically resisting because those night sticks hurt, you know, and that gas and those iron pipes they were using to whip us with and breaking bones and, you know, we had to, we had to find a way to struggle, not in place of that, but along with that. Uh, there was a there was a prisoner on the tier who was who had taught himself the law, and so you know we said, well, we need to start taking these people to court. In prison, there are only two ways to bring about change. It is either through the legislative body or through the court system. Obviously, we were not going to get any sympathy or help from the legislative body, so we decided we would take 
and challenge what was happening in Angola and the court system. So in order to do that, we had to learn the law. So we got at it, you know. We, you know, a good friend of mine's uh, he 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 started a, a group uh, that's very successful in prison reform. Now, his name is Norris Henderson, and the group is called Vote, you know, Vote a, a Voice of the Experience. Him and other inmate counsel made it possible for us to get books that we normally wouldn't have been been able to have, you know. And so it took, you know months and years of studying the law, you know, and I can still remember, as I see it earlier times when I was sitting on the floor of my cell trying to, to frame an argument for some particular human right violation or civil right violation or violation of the statutory law. And, you know, you, you're an experienced attorney, you know how difficult that is because every judge seems to have a different interpretation of what the Constitution is or what statutory law how it should be applied. So, you know, you're trying to find in this this law case say one thing and this law case contradicts that and this law case contradicts both of them. But yet now you you know that somewhere in there there's that little nugget. There's that little uh uh something that all of the judges agree upon. And so you try to find that. And once you find it then you try to sh shape your legal argument. And you present that to the court, and you cross your fingers. And so, you know, unfortunately, we lost more cases than we won, but the ones we won seem to make up for all the ones we lost. Yeah. What are some of the things that you know have changed with respect to how Louisiana deals with solitary confinement after your advocacy? Of course, you know, uh, with the representation of you and one of my other attorneys, Harmony Lowe, uh, and George Kendall and, and, and Corinne Williams and Corinne uh, Ire, uh, you know, uh, the civil suit we filed was cello. And a part of the agreement is they had to change the way they run CCR. So now you have a situation where, you know, a dead row who lives under the same conditions are now given group hall, they've give they give them more time out to sell, more time on the yard on a daily basis and and, and CCR has uh CCR is the closed agent. cell restrictions. It's solitary confinement. And so what has what has happened now is they they form what's called a, a transitional dormitory. And so if you in in solitary for a certain amount of time then they remove you from a cell to that dorm. And depending on your conduct, uh, you will eventually, in theory, transition into prison population. And, you know, uh, the, the, the horror, one of the horrors of uh, solitary is you can be placed in there for anything. You know, any, I mean, a guard, you, you know, may be trying to handle you in an undignified manner. And you may demand that he treat you with, with, with human dignity. And he can have you locked up in solitary confinement. And I don't know about other prisoners, but in, 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 in Angola, the average stay in solitary confinement, no matter what you there, is five years. Yeah. And so you have this situation. Now you have a situation in this country with the invent of the prison industrial complex where prisoners are being built for solitary confinement. They're not building dormitories anymore. All the buildings are cell blocks. You know? And it, it, you know, according to some of the research they've done, it's much cheaper to house prisoners in, in cells. And they are able to control the actions of the prisoners more. And should prisoners rebel against being treated a certain way, then it's much easier to be isolated in a cell by themselves. So what was once a punishment has now become a way of housing prisons. And so that's part of the battle where we're trying to, you know, to educate the public against the horrors of, of, of private prisons in this country, which has become such a, a prosperous enterprise that they're trading on Wall Street now. So you can imagine the amount of money that's being made when you can have stock on Wall Street. 
So, you know, one of the most worries, they changed their name to something, but it was, it was called Wacken Hut. You know, and they built private prisons all around the world. And when you when they build these private prisons, they take your taxpayers' money, and they must guarantee these people that they will pay them for ninety percent of the capacity of the prison, in regards to how many prisons they prisons they have in there. So they could have they could be have fifty percent capacity bed space, but they still must pay these companies. Ninety uh, percent, and that's not counting uh, phone calls and medical care or lack of uh, items of clothing, uh, canteen. Uh, you know, uh, they virtually have a, a co-opted the entire prison system in this country, and your taxpayer dollars go, you know, towards this. There's one thing that you would hope. Uh, folks who read your book sort of take away uh, something that they really remember or, or that stays with them, what would you say that, that you would hope they would take? Well, for me, I think it would be the strength of the human spirit. You know, if you don't allow yourself to be broken, you can survive anything. You know, I always remember reading something that was in an article or something where, you know, Mr. Ma Nelson Mandela of South Africa said, if the cause you, you carry is noble, you can carry the weight of the world. And I thought fighting for humanity was a noble cause. So that allowed me to carry the burden of the beatings, the gassings, or the horrors of being confined to a cell no bigger than the average bathroom or closet for 44 years and 10 months. I was willing to, Harmon gave his life, and I was willing to give mine if necessary because I believe in humanity, and I believe that we have the ability to be a better people and build a better society. And so that's, you know, that's, you know, besides my, my grandbabies, that's what motivates me to do what I'm doing. I don't want them to be, you know, 30, 40 years from now, I don't want my grand, one of my grandkids to be sitting before an audience doing the same thing I'm doing. When you think about social justice movements now, um, one of the criticisms that can be levied toward the movement for Black Lives, Black Lives Matter movement uh, previously known as, um, is that it's too aggressive or... Um, to fill in the blank. Um, I know that you and Herman have thoughts on that. Um, well, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm 100% support the Black Lives Matter. As a matter of fact, uh, whenever Robert and I go on, on a speaking engagement, we always try to meet with leadership of the Black Lives Matter in whatever city we are. We, we met with uh, there are Black Lives Matter chapters now in England and Paris, France and stuff. And so we always try to meet with them and give them the benefit of our experiences and our wisdom and, 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 and learn what we can from them. You know, uh, one of the things life has taught me is that, uh, you know, each one teach one. Meaning, you know, uh, no matter what I teach you, there's always something that I can learn from you. And so, you know, uh, I think the biggest problem in, in Black Lives Matter is the same as with the Black Panther Party. You know, they represent a threat to the challenge of the powers that be in this country and the culture and the institutions, how they are ran, and how they affect the lives of the people in society. And so the same technique that was used against the Black Panther Party, as you, as you said earlier, for years, decades, the federal government, particularly on the J. Edgar Hoover, shaped people's opinion about what the black what the Black Panther Party was and, and and the mischaracterization of what they was, what they believed in, what they were trying to do. So you have that same thing happening now with the Black Lives Matter movement. First of all, they're trying to uh make it a one issue movement and that is the continued debt of African American men by police around this country. Black Lives Matter is not a one issue movement. It is a complete total movement. 
it, 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 it's, ta- it's about economic empowerment. It's about social justice. It's about uh, community policing. It's about, uh, uh, you know, uh, creating institutions that bring out the very best in humanity. You know, and it is about placing the integrity of the human being above the, the dollar and cents. So, you know, I think, you know, uh, it's more difficult now because with the invent of the Internet and, and stuff, you know, uh, the mass media, the corporate control media can no longer control the flow of information that goes out to the public. You know, and so, you know, I think that, you know, it's more difficult for them to uh, create a certain image in the minds of the American people about the Black Lives Movement. So do you have hope for social justice and progress? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't do 44 years in solitary <laughs> confinement without hope, you know? Uh, I, you know, I never gave up hope. <laughs> you know, I never gave up hope. I never for once doubted that one day I would be free. And, you know, uh, a lot of what I'm trying to do now, uh, in 72, when Robert, I mean, when Herman and I were placed in solitary confinement, we made a solemn vow that we, prisoners had no voice and they had no face. And that when we went free, no matter how long it took, we would be that voice. We would be the face. We would say, this is what your sons and daughters and your grandparents and your parents, this is what they look like. And they need your love and your support. And so that's what we, you know, we're trying to do. We're trying to uh, uh, make families remember that, you know, prisoners come from your household. And because of particularly the economic situation in this country, the overwhelming majority of the men, women, and children, they wind up in prison from economic situation. You know, the strongest uh, instinct in humanity is survival. And I think every man, woman, and child would like to be able to survive in, within the Constitution, the statutory laws, or whatever country they live in. But unfortunately, in America, that's not the case. That's not our reality. You know, so most of us, uh, African Americans and other minorities and poor whites, wind up in prison because they're trying to survive. And if they can't survive the right way, then they're going to survive any way they can. You know, unfortunately, you know, they hurt, you know, society more than they help. But, you know, desperation, you know, excuse my language, but my mom used to tell me, boy, a drowning man will grab a turtle shit if it flow by. You know, and no disrespect, but that's, that's true. You know, you can't, you can't oppress a individual or a group of individuals. You can't deny them human dignity and pride and sense of self-worth and then act, ask them to be a part of society, to, to live within the Constitution, live within statutory law, we're, live within the culture. You, know, you, have to, you have to create a society where everyone has an opportunity. Right now, and we were talking about this earlier, you have men and women in prison who, who can litigate as well as any attorney in this country. You have men who can take a piece of wood and turn it into the most beautiful sculpture or take paint and a canvas and create the most beautiful picture. Why does the institutions in this country did not create an environment where these people could have realized they had this gift? or they had this talent, or they had this ability. You know, why they had to go to prison when in most cases it was too late, but rather be- than become discouraged and hopeless and give up on themselves or give up on the lots, they, they still, you know, applied uh, this skill or this talent. They still, uh, you know, uh, re-educated themselves or educate themselves in some, in, in some cases and become very productive uh, 
people, very productive, and would, could be released in society and probably would be, uh, you know, uh, make society much richer, much better than what it is now. But because of the attitudes of uh, thing, and what's worse now is with the invent of the private uh, uh, industrial prison complex that exists in this country. The impetus now is to make money. Every uh, prison bed represents cons- uh, cents and dollars. So there's no uh, desire to rehabilitate or to create environments where, you know, uh, people can become better human beings, better, better members of, of humanity, and, you know, uh, work towards a better society. The emphasis now is to get rich, to be able to ride around in big cars or own big houses, you know, uh, yachts and all the other luxuries of the very rich in this country. I'm not condemning, uh, you know, uh, people who are fortunate enough to be rich, but I am saying, you know, uh, where's your conscience? You know, where's your sense of humanity? You know, where your own personal luxury, luxury at the expense of other men, women, and children means more than the new car you have or uh, the fancy house you got. And so, you know, uh, until the ancestors you know, say it's time to come home. This is what I'll be doing. Uh, my book, the, mo- the motivation behind this book was no matter how many speaking engagements I have, no matter how many people I come before, I will never be able to reach as many people as this book will. You know, this book has the potential of re- reaching hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people. So this book, in a sense, is my voice. And it's my way of of using uh, my experiences and the wisdom that come from them and to teach and raise the level of consciousness of humanity. There's no better place to turn it over for questions than there. So there is the microphone. (laughs) Now you can see why he's my personal hero. (laughs) If you just come to the microphone, thank you. Uh, good evening, and thank you so much for your humanity and your gifts that you're sharing with so many people. Um, sir, I would like to ask a question. Um, well, I guess I don't need to re- to ask if I need to record it because you're filming this, right? For like, okay, so I'll put this away. Um, my question is about grand jury. I am currently serving on a federal grand jury. Uh, It's a totally surreal experience. We were told by the judge that we are there to be a protection against government overreach. And um, all of the people I'm serving with for an entire year, we all um, have different feelings about that. And I wanted to hear what your thoughts are and if you have any ideas about how that could be changed for the better, to better protect people who have been accused of crimes. Thank you. You know, uh, first of all, I think the the laws, the statutory laws that govern grand juries need to be changed because, you know, in in our situation, uh, you know, my case is almost unheard of. It was overturned four different times. And only one stuck, and that was granting me a new trial. Uh, the last time I was in, indicted and was in 2015. And the lady that was the filming of the grand jury was deeply upset and disturbed by what was taking place. The uh, illegal, unconstitutional, inhumane tactics that the district attorney was using to have me reindicted. But because of the laws and and, 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 and stat, you know, constitution and amendments and statutory laws, she felt helpless to do anything about it without risking her own freedom. And she has a twin sister. And so when when uh, her sister knew she was on a grand jury and she knew, you know, uh, my case was one of the cases that would go before the grand jury. So she started doing her own research. And so her sister uh, was uh, so bothered by what had took place 
she went to her and she says, you know, we just indicted this man and they did all kind of things, you know, that he shouldn't have done. And her sister said, I don't know how to tell you this, but I think y'all just indicted an innocent man. And from that point on, they have become ardent supporters of Robert and myself and good friends. And, but the most amazing thing is you have these two women, Southern Bells, conservative Republicans, who have now become social actors, and they look to us for inspiration and leadership. And so they wrote over 500 letters to judges, district attorneys, prosecutors, police uh, chiefs and everything, complaining about the way the judicial and and the police departments in this state, state of Louisiana, was conducting themselves and demanding change. And they're still at it even to this day, you know. And as I said, you know, uh, they asked to meet with us once we got out. And now, you know, I count them among the many wonderful friends, uh, you know, that I've made since I've, uh, you know, gained my physical freedom. And I say physical freedom because, ment you know, emotionally and mentally and philosophically, I've been free for a long time. My freedom was a physical, you know, my, my imprisonment. They imprisoned my body, but they couldn't imprison my mind, my heart, my soul, my spirit, you know. And so on, on, on those things, they failed miserably, you know. So uh, to answer your question, uh, I think I was talking with the law students earlier, and we have a tendency in this country to think that occupations and positions in life give us integrity. That's not how I support the work. We support to bring integrity to whatever position we have, whatever uh, 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 you know, occupation we in. We bring it integrity. Society don't give integrity to us. We give integrity to society. So when you're sitting on a grand jury, you know, follow your instincts. If the district attorney is saying one thing, but the proof or the circumstance or whatever that's before you is saying to something else, trust, trust you, as my mom used to say, trust your gut. You know, Don't be afraid to say no when every instinct in your body is screaming, this don't make sense. This is not right. You know? And I think, you know, that is probably the first step toward creating a better grand jury system. Thank you very much for sharing your voice with us and your very powerful messages. I look forward to reading your book and sharing with others. This is a more mundane question, but important. The day you walked out of the prison, what support if any, did you get from the government? Ten dollars and a bus ticket. That was it. That's all they give you in, in Louisiana. Wow. You can be yeah. in prison 30, 40 years. When you leave, they give you a bus ticket and ten dollars. Fortunately for me, I had family, I had friends where you know we we formed uh uh you know the uh, international coalition free to angle the tree. <laughs> and from that I made uh, so many friends and family and of course great attorneys you know uh, uh, Catherine and, and, and Harmony and George Kendall and Corinne Williams, Corinne Irish you know so we had attorneys that believed in us that saw the, our humanity and were not you know the, uh, the sad thing about uh, the judicial system in this country is that it has been reduced to due process you know guilt or innocence doesn't matter it doesn't even come into play is as long as the DA do, the police do it by the book, the DA do it by the book, the judge do it by the book, no one ever stops to think this man or this woman or this child is innocent, you know. And, you know, we have to, we have to restore that back into the judicial system and the police forces and the district attorneys, you know, of this country and, and of this world. We have to demand from them the very best. There's no shortcut to it. Hey, what's up, brother? Thank you uh, 
for coming today. Um, I got a question. Has anyone been locked up as long as you in this country? Solitary well, confinement? Unfortunately, uh, I have the distinction uh, mm -hmm. of being the longest held prisoners in solitary confinement in the history of American prisons. How many years was that? I stayed in solitary confinement 44 years and 10, and 10 months. months. Okay. We think it's yeah. the longest in um, the world based on what's available in terms of the yeah. records. Yeah, I, I was thinking that too. But uh, no, I grew up in a very, I'm from D.C. I grew up in a very political, militant uh, family as well. My people were Black Panthers and they grew up, uh, I'm, I'm a product of uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad Nation of Islam schools um, here in D.C. myself. But um, I want to ask you another question. This is only two questions. I got so much to talk about right now because um, the problem I see now currently, what's, what's happening now in the black community is black people. Now, I'm 51, which is a short period of time, I know, compared to what's in the audience now. But I've, I'm seeing something I've never seen before among black people, especially in D.C. I'm seeing a certain fear among them. I'm seeing a certain, um, a very uh, contentious existence between uh, black people uh, in D.C., um, especially the men and the women. Um, they don't speak to each other. They're afraid to speak to each other, look each other in the face. Um, I don't know what's going on. I've never seen this before. Um, also seeing, um, hypocrisy, a lot of hypocrisy among black people that I've never seen before. It's like they double dealing or triple dealing. I don't know what's going on with them. Um, the existence is very premium, premium, you know, uh, I've never seen that before. People say, well, where you been at? But I, I have a very rare background. But the point is, is that when you talk about this desperation, you, you said people are subject to doing anything when they're desperate. And this is not just the poor people. This is the people who are middle class, very well educated, and who have established themselves in this society, especially among black people. They, they get these jobs, you see them, because I was on jury duty, that lady excused me from jury duty um, because I had an overwhelming influence on a particular case, which is a drug case. So I had to go back, but it's a, that's a long story. But the point is they, 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 they have this point system where they get money for locking brothers up. And many of them come out of Howard University, law school. They come from all of these different uh, schools and they doing this and they know what they're doing. They got sons at home, they got kids at home, but they do it and they go home and they don't have a, like you said, they don't have a conscience. Is this a part of the desperation on that level that we are dealing with now in the black community? Is that, is that a part of that desperation on that level? And please talk about that level rather than the desperation of the poor, because many people talk about the poor, but they don't talk, the, they don't talk about the desperation of the middle and the upper class blacks. Please talk about that. Well, in America, we live in what's called a class society. You know, uh, you're well determined what class you belong to. And usually the old saying, birds of a feather flock together. You know, I remember one time I was reading about this study in, in, in high school where they divide the kids into different groups. And all the groups had, you know, African American, Hispanic American, white. American and stuff, you know. And so all of these kids, no matter what their backgrounds were, began to adapt the values, the principles and stuff of the group they belong to. And so you have a situation in this country where the culture of this country, we are a class society and our sense of, of, of self-worth is determined on how much wealth we can accumulate and how that wealth is used. And so as long as we, you know, operate on that principle, there will always be that contradiction. Now, you can look at that contradiction in two ways. You can look at it and become angry and bitter and start hating, you know, or you can look at it as a contradiction to humanity, and you try to develop ways in which you can fight to bridge that gap. 
here's one thing we all, I don't think people realize. What's the purpose of living in an organized society? If it's not going to guarantee you the basic necessities, food, shelter, medical care, education, opportunity. The society can't make you happy. Happiness must come from within you. So your main objective should be to build a better humanity who can build a better society. And my brother, find other men and women and children who, who think like you and find, find, you know, form a political party or oversight group or whatever and try to fight this, not by hatred. You know, one individuals create chaos. Mass movements create change. So your goal should always be to create a mass movement. And to, to, to bridge that gap between those who have nothing and those who have everything. And eventually, you know, you hope uh, that, you know, you build a society where the value and uh, of its citizens means more than the individual wealth. So if the next three people who have questions, if you just ask your questions all at once and then Albert, you can answer them, but just ask the three questions in a row. Oh, hello. I want to thank Mr. Woodfox for your faith in American society, that you didn't just disappear, but you wrote a book, and it's a book for us to read and respond to, and your faith that will respond correctly. I'd like to repay that forward. Um, I'm a citizen of Maryland. Maryland has a lot of prisoners, tens of thousands of prisoners, a lot of people in solitary they're cutting budgets for correctional officers. So as you said, it's cheaper to keep people in the cell blocks. Um, our legislative session is just about over for this year. But I would like to, uh, for the coming year, find some sponsors. I think I know some people we could ask in our state Senate and our House of Delegates in Annapolis and work to banish solitary confinement in Maryland and also do as New York City did and provide free telephone calls. For prisoners. Um, I'm going to be standing right over here by this pillar for a while after this is over. So any other citizens of Maryland want to join, come. We're going to share email addresses and get started. Thank you. I, uh, I'm totally in awe of your humanity and your faith and your courage. Um, I'm curious if in all of the um, awful things that were done to you by prison guards, if you ever had experiences of, um, of them seeing that humanity and responding, and I'm curious if there's anything that we all could learn from that, um, any, any times when that, um, that there was any kind of difference in, in term, uh, compared to the awful ways that you were treated most of the time. You. Hi, I was just curious, um, what was your highest moment and what was your lowest moment during your time in solitary? Uh, as I said earlier, yes, my highest moment was to teach a man how to read and write. My lowest moment, I was in, in, uh, in a dungeon, as they call it, because I resisted being treated a certain way. And uh, it was in the wintertime, and they, they turned off the heating system and the water. And then all survive, I was forced to drink out of the toilet. I think that was the lowest moment. Now, toilets and dungeons are filthy, you know, but the, the instinct and the will to survive is probably, like I say, the strongest emotion that runs through human beings. And I think that was probably the lowest. Uh, in between that, it was all, you know, Mostly all hell, but every once in a while, you know, uh, something would happen. We would win a small battle that made all the other, the, the brutality and the punishment and whatever uh, worth it. And, 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 you know, as I said earlier, through in life, what I've learned is that one human being or some event will raise the level of consciousness of the people around him. That is an opportunity. 
what you do with it, you'll determine how you turn out and how society as a whole turn out. And then the question before was about whether there were moments of connection or humanity with any guards. Yeah. You know, you know, it was it was crazy because I remember reading Nelson Mandela book and he was talking about how, you know, he had always seen the prison guards as the enemy. But over a period of time, he began to realize that these were men and women who had families, who had children and stuff, you know, and that, you know, if. If he didn't see them so much as an enemy, but to see them as, again, fathers and mothers and brothers and sisters and stuff, then it would make it easier for him to relate to them as human beings. And he re- and so he started to do that, you know, and he realized, uh, you know, the, the response he got was, was amazing, you know. And, you know, I, I myself went through that. There was a period of time when I really hated white people. You know, I'm, 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 I'm not proud of it, but it was a period in my life when everything that went wrong with me, all of my suffering, pain and suffering, were caused by a system that, you know, and, but, you know, through self education and experience and wisdom and stuff, you know, I began to see. Every man, woman, and child as a member of the human race. <laughs> Nothing else. If a person was bad, it wasn't bad because they were white or black or because they were Latino or Italian. They were bad because experiencing their life made them that way. And so I began to, you know, take my leave from Mandela. You know, I stopped automatically assuming that every prison guard was my enemy. And so I started evaluating each prison guard based upon his conduct and his attitude and the way he treated uh, prisoners. And, 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 you know, the response was, was overwhelming. Uh, you know, people often say, well, you're so calm. And you so, you know, look, I'm very angry, very bitter. <laughs> you, know? You, you know, you don't lock a man in the cell for 44 years and 10 months, you know, and, you know, but. I learned a long time ago. I define me. I define who I am. I develop my moral principles and values and my code of conduct. My way of getting back at all the people who hurt me and brutalized me and took over half of my life from me for a crime I didn't commit by sitting here with you and doing the very opposite of what they thought I would turn out to be. My prison cell was meant to be a debt chamber. I turned it into a high school and a university and a debate hall and a law clinic. You know? So everything they wanted me to be, I figured that my best revenge was to be the opposite of that. Uh, why don't we give another round of applause for Albert Ward Fox? <laughs> <laughs>